Good everyone. Welcome to the KGC uh, Four Ball podcast that we've got on this evening. Uh, my name is uh, Fraser Bondi Bond. Joining us this evening, we've got Mr. Level Pegs, Cameron Jones from the admin team, and our special guest, uh, Daniel Hillier. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Fraser. Thanks for having us, Fraser. Yeah. We've got a, also got PVK there still. I don't know if he's a. Uh, He's in or he's out. We'll get him there. He's out. <laughs> Technical difficulties. So, um, yeah, we're back after uh, a little break that we took last week. Uh, all of us had some uh, in real life stuff that we had to do. So we appreciate everyone for uh, tuning back in uh, this week and joining us. So we'll get straight back into it. Um, what we'd like to do first uh, is start in with a bit of a check-in, uh, which we're going to have everyone do. Uh, see what they're drinking tonight. So should we start with uh, Level Pegs? Uh, Sam, how's the week going, brother? How's the, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, the, the the week's going. It's uh, very windy and very cold here in Wellington and a lot of rain. So um, the golf course has been semi-closed a couple of days just due to flooding. So, yeah, great start to summer. Um, this evening I've just got a, a good George cider. So Ooh. that's the guys in Hamilton there. So. Just chewing on one of those. But yeah, week's been good. Just getting through the daily stuff and um, good to be on the pod. H- how are you doing, Dan? Welcome. Long time no see. Welcome home. Yeah, good to see yeah, you, Dan. Mate. Yeah, no, good to see you guys too. It's obviously been a while. But uh, yeah, doing okay. It's uh, nice to be back home. Obviously, um, as saying before, Sammy's pretty pretty dull with the last couple of days. So yeah, just... Uh, been sitting around at home twiddling my thumbs a little bit these last couple of days. Um, but yeah, overall feeling pretty good. And uh, yeah, I myself have just had my bloody two and a half litre uh, bottle of water here that I've been sipping on throughout the day. It's pretty standard. Uh, standard well, that's stuff. healthy. So yeah, <laughs> keeping, it, keeping it basic. But, no, we're all good then. Very good. Nice. What about Cam Jones? How's the week, man? Um, the week's been the week's been good, mate. Um, Saturday had a mate's birthday. We played golf down at Takapuna, which was cool. Um, and then, yeah, it was nice over the weekend. I'm sure you did as well. Fraser managed to go up to a few bars on the weekend, or at least go sample some some beers. I'm sure you did. Um, so that was fun. But the last couple of days have been kind of tricky because my laptop um, absolutely caked itself. So that's why I'm running this off the iPhone. So um, yeah, it's been a little bit stressful with work and stuff, not being able to do that. But all in all, pretty good. Um, I've actually got the the remedy organic kombucha tonight um, and a bottle of water for me. So, um, yeah, keeping it pretty, pretty, pretty tame tonight, Fraser. What about you, Bella? Yeah, well, that's that's actually a good point. Well, we'll have to apologize if there's any uh, there's sound issues there because we're on cams on a on a temporary setup. Can hear them pretty good though. So, uh, is it all right? Bad. Yeah, it's yeah, actually good. It looks, yeah, Chris, I think it looks better than mine. So, <laughs> <laughs> doing well. <laughs> Might be in the permanent setup. Ah, uh, yeah, no, it was good. Um, hit, hit, hit a big number actually. Uh, actually, last week hit hit thirty years age of old age of old. That's uh, how I got there uh, in lockdown, which was um, which was good fun. Um, and then yes, when the lockdown uh, came up, uh, came open on Friday, uh, played a bit of golf with MWSS. Those boys yeah. there uh, had a, a handful, and then another handful, and then another handful of beers. <laughs> um, and I felt yeah, actually fine. But that's probably got to have something to do with me just drinking at home during the lockdown thing it's it's a little weird now you go out buy a few and then you get a bit stuck um but no yeah. week's been pretty good uh playing a bit more golf back's definitely feeling it uh but i'm really enjoying it especially with our good weather that we have up here in auckland to rub it into the wellingtonians down there yeah thanks for that <laughs> yeah yeah so um if you've got any questions uh out there this evening uh we've got quite a few of us actually tuned in already uh please send them in any questions for dan uh cam sam or myself uh just yeah find them through and um we'll get to those later in the time yeah you're gonna so, have to um, keep sorry phrase you're gonna have to keep an eye on those mate because i actually can't see any of the chat on my off my phone here so oh i've got all the responsibility oh another all the responsibilities with you mate oh no that's don't know how we'll manage them so uh, one big one that we want to kick off with, uh, I don't know if you listened in, Dan, or you maybe you saw our little Instagram thing, but uh, Foxy was on a couple of weeks ago and he told us this uh, story about how you just absolutely slaughtered uh, Daniel Berger and Ricky Fowler. And we weren't sure if it was true or not until uh, we got evidence that came through. <laughs> <laughs> 
verified profile, <laughs> Ricky Fowler. Uh, he let us know it was true. So um, tell us yeah. about that. Did you, did you get paid? I think that's where everyone wants to start. <laughs> yeah, I was um, I was hopeful. Um, took, a, took a couple of days, but uh, yeah, saw, saw Dan Berger um, in the players' lounge a couple of days later, and he sort of stared at me and didn't, didn't honestly recognise me at first, and so I was just staring, and then we see the light bulb go off, and he's like, oh, shit. Got your money, mate. And so he just pulled out his wallet and says, How much was it? A couple hundred? Oh, yeah, sweet. I'll, I'll take that. I don't actually know, but yeah. So no, that's a good, good little payday for me, actually. <laughs> good way to start the week. Uh, good to yeah, know they yeah. pay up. Yeah, yeah no, that was good. They would, ha- they would have to there too. So he said, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely took them to pieces. I mean, we can talk it up now. We obviously know Ricky listens in. Uh, Daniel probably does too. But um, <laughs> what's, it, what's it like just getting out there and playing with, with guys like that on the tour and um, and just a fun game like that or fun? Yeah. Say, quotation well, points. yeah, I mean, as yeah, as fun as it's meant to be, you know, I'm, as, you know, my first time going in a head-to-head match against a couple of best players in the world. So I was sketching out. Um, pretty early on in the day and uh, yeah I mean front nine we were just sort of taking it easy doing our own thing and then um, obviously it was pretty routine stuff for those boys so they wanted to jazz it up a little bit get a match going and um, yeah they were they were ripping into me those first couple of holes they were um, yeah making sure that I uh, I felt like I was the uh, I was the newbie and um, I definitely did but no I got off, got off a pretty hot start and had a little three footer on the on the first half of the birdie and um, yeah, Daniel Berger's ripping into me trying to trying to get into my head as much as he could and uh, yeah, managed to drain that one right in the middle from there pretty clutch and then um, yeah, managed to, managed to catch catch fire from there and uh, yeah, I don't know, it's just great, you know, being able to go up against those guys and, and put up a good fight. It's just uh, it's a shame it was on a Tuesday and uh, <laughs> didn't have much to show on Thursday and Friday, but no, it was, it was great fun either way. It's a real good, like a big aspect of the day, like where you think, oh, you can go out and, and beat some of those guys on that day, and then you've got to turn up for the, the following two days. Is it maybe playing with those guys, or maybe there's other bigger people that you've played with before? What do you find it like way more nerve wracking going into a Thursday um, tournament or, or teeing off with those guys for a couple of hundred if that was the, the go? Oh, definitely still. I mean, thinking back to the first tee shot on Thursday, um, yes. Yeah. I don't think we've been much more nervous than that moment there. Um, yeah, it's uh, just the whole the whole atmosphere. You know, you got all the crowds just sort of hovering around you. You can just feel everyone's eyes just, you know, lays it onto you. And um, yeah, it's all pretty quiet. And you know that you're the centre of attention. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's just a massive buzz. And you know, it's my second second major, and I definitely felt a lot more comfortable in that on that uh, tee shot of the Open than I did in the US Open a couple of years prior. Um, so yeah, I think for me, it's a case of you know trying to get myself into that position as much as possible and just getting used to the environment and then yeah hopefully uh you know as we as we go down the road i'm a little bit more comfortable and can actually start to put some good numbers on the board cool yeah. cool, cool, cool. so um we'll move in we we like to do some quick fire questions uh to start off maybe i'll uh, i'll run through mine cam and then i don't know if sam do you have any quick fire questions sam or you just got the um, time ones I've got a couple of ones that I expect very long answers. Uh, so okay, so they're not, they're not, they're long fire questions. Okay. So we'll, we'll do my ones. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll throw, we'll throw some stuff at you here. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, belly putter for or against? Um, against. Okay. Good. All right. Well, that's okay. That's Are we doing one word or do you want to send it to not one. No, that's, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to get one other person on my side. I'm, I'm hugely outmatched at the moment over, over time. <laughs> uh, do you ever have any drinks on course? Are you more drinks after the game sort of a guy or just on the big waters? Yeah, just on the waters on the course. But, yeah, uh, more partial to a beer afterwards. Nice, be nice. Done, especially, you know, some New Zealand summer. There it is. The staple. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, joggers, uh, the pants. Joggers, for or against those? Mm. Uh, I'm going to say four. I wear them, so I'd be oh. lying if I was saying against it. <laughs> there we go. And um, here's a new one I'm, I'm, I'm throwing in there. Is, um, let's say you're an amateur at your club competition. You're a good right-handed player on a two handicap. Are you allowed to enter into a tournament as a left-hander on a higher handicap? Uh, yes, I think so. Ooh. Yeah, okay. I think the same. Yeah. 
We're on the same page there. Yeah. You know, we can clip all that and we'll. So we'll how do you decide the left-handed handicap? <laughs> no, you, know, you, you actually have to go out. Well, I feel like, yeah, five, I feel yeah, like you have to have obviously, yeah, have, yeah, have your designated amount of rounds to get your handicap or whatever, and then you can just play yeah. that. I like yeah, the idea of having two handicaps. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, yeah it's very much cool. like um, yeah, very much like Dan Crook, our other admin member. He was left-handed, and uh, now he's right-handed, and he enters all his tournaments and right-handed too. So um, yeah, just like oh, oh vice versa. I'm just interested to see what everyone sorts out. So um, okay, Cam, hit us with your big time ones. Yeah, these are these are my three questions, Dan. We actually started this with, this with Jimmy uh, when he was a guest a few months back, but. I guess instead of instead of framing the question around it's a Saturday night and you're out drinking, because um, you've won a few tournaments in your time. So let's go Sunday night, you've just won. I think I know what your drink of choice is, but what's your drink of choice, mate? Well, I drink it. <laughs> um, I mean, it depends how late in the night it is, I guess. <laughs> but um, probably tequila if it's, uh, if it's a bit of a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they're serving, serving up in the crush, you throw it out anyway. <laughs> Yeah, no, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, no, all right, yeah. cool. You're on, you're on your way home, mate, from the from the bars. You've just you've just been celebrating out out with the win. What are you stopping to eat on the way home? Stopping to eat, oh, it's got to be a little Domino's pizza, I think. Oh, oh okay. nice. It's the first person that hasn't said McDonald's. Um, oh, right. Yeah, interesting. Big the, pizza. What's that, mate? Big pizza fan. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. And then next day, you're dusty, you're hungover. Could be a travel day. What are you watching on Netflix? Oh, gosh. Um, I haven't watched a whole lot on Netflix, really, to be honest. What? Siobhan's next to me. I'm going to What were we, <laughs> what were we watching um, in isolation? What, the Squid Game. Squid Game, yeah. Oh, that would okay. be fun. Oh, and, yeah. And That's the latest in clickbait. With, uh, with good. So probably one of those two. Yeah, nice, bro. That's it for me, Mr. Level Pigs, mate. You got your long form questions ready? Oh, I got a a couple of um, short ones, and one that is either going to be short or long answer. But um, who do you who who have you found yourself uh, traveling with, and um, you know, hanging out a lot with, and playing with a lot? I see you um, sort of tend to hang out with some of the Aussie boys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so Blake Windred is uh, is one of those guys who you know I've I've played a lot of amateur golf with him uh, growing up, and yeah, so he's obviously going down the same route as me, and so we we sort of room together for the first couple of months, and um, yeah, sort of shared cost and all that sort of jazz. But um, yeah, he's probably the guy I spent the most time with uh, while I was over there early on. Then sort of linked in with Gears a little bit later on in the year um, for a couple of tournaments. So yeah, it's good. There's definitely a good uh, good bunch of Australians over there that you know you can link in with throughout the year. So yeah, it's not like I'm uh, sort of doing it all on my own. Yeah, oh yeah, she was there obviously, and so yeah, she was she was um yeah pretty pretty good to have over there for the first uh, well for the second half of the year. Um, yeah, it's pretty pretty tough going before they lifted the restrictions, so yeah, it was yeah. nice to have her over, and then obviously she jumped on the bag and made my life a little easier. So no, it was really good. Nice. I hear she did a really good job too on the bag, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> had right. some good results. Yeah, I mean we we certainly did. So uh, yeah, who knows? She she may have to. Have to come over again and uh, give it another crack, depending on how things go. But yeah, no, she was. have got the job. <laughs> <laughs> All time. Um, I, I do have another question that, yeah, like I say, it could be a long answer or a short answer. Um, but do you have any any word or information on the PGL or the potential SGL? Do you have you heard anything? The, the Premier yeah, Golf League, um, Saudi Golf League. Uh, right. I've uh, very little info on that. Um, but yeah, it's going to be interesting to see to see how it all pans out. I mean, obviously got some pretty big aspirations around it, so yeah. We'll I feel like you can be a very good uh, target. <laughs> oh, yeah, don't know about yeah, don't know about that. But uh, no, I mean, it sounds like it's going to be pretty lucrative um, the way things are going. So yeah, who knows? They they could get some big names, uh, especially you know, obviously Greg Norman being the front runner. He's got some mm. got quite a bit of influence in the golfing world. So um, yeah, who knows? Yeah, interesting. It should be it'd be interesting to see what happens going forward. Mm. But I think it's gonna happen very fast. Early next year we'll lower, know a lot more, I think. So Yeah, yeah definitely. You can't play both tours A up there, is it? Have you got to choose one or the other? Is that what the players have to decide? I think I think that's yeah, what we yeah. everyone's trying to figure out. 
Yeah, I feel like it would be the case. I'm not sure the PGA Tour would um, be too happy with people chopping and changing. So, yeah, yeah, it might have to be one or the other, unfortunately. Interesting. Now that's that's all for me. Anyway, for now. Is that all? Yeah. Okay. Is that all? Well, is that it? Oh, we got some big ones coming up. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Um, we'll give you a bit of a break there, Dan. I just need to go through a couple of a uh, couple of points uh, that we got in our little uh, our golf club. Um, I don't know if you know too much about our Kiwi Golf Club, but uh, we are actually creeping up on 4,000 members and um, on our Facebook page. And uh, our 100th membership can't be too far away for our actual handicap membership. So um, we're getting closer. So talking about new members, uh, uh, Nick Yeager, Arain Owen, Ryan Fryer, and Caleb Marshall are our four new members. So welcome to the club, guys. Um, great to see you signing up. Yeah, big round of applause. We've we've gone we've done this now for twelve weeks and we still haven't got the pause button on the uh, on the <laughs> podcast yet. That's where our, our new one. Out. Yeah, new new little soundboard. That's when that's when PJ comes back, but he's um he gives his apologies. He's out on uh, uh what is it? Uh, Howick Twilight tonight. Howick Twilight mm-hmm. evening. Uh, doing that there. So with actually Mr. Caddy Batch, there's uh we got to give them a huge shout out. They're actually doing their longest day on Monday, I believe, just coming up. Um, if you haven't seen that that group that he's been posting up all over social media for the longest day event, they are currently just ticked over seventeen thousand dollars in a charity money raise. Which yeah, that's a huge achievement. There's Good about age. thirty, yeah, about thirty nine of them out there. Uh, or maybe might might even be close to forty now. Uh, I might have to join the team after seeing how well they're doing and help them get up there. But no, that's really epic to see them doing and, and all of them. Uh, banding together so um if you need to support them uh that link will be down in the comments i'll post that for them there too finally we've got this shout out here to carl tilly uh longest drive uh 300 holes completed in wellington also good luck to the caddy batch oh that's oh god i butchered that for the apita there sorry <laughs> so he's, he's given me a few points here to go through but uh he's just added comments but no uh shout out carl tilly uh, he won the longest drive over the weekend. Uh, well done there, mate. Yeah, he did very well, man. Some grueling weather from time to time, and man, that's a lot of holes carrying his golf bag. 54 so holes that, a day for three, seven days. So. Uh, holes 300 holes. Sorry, what? How many holes a day was it? Uh, 54, three rounds. Did he play the same course every day? Or did he... No, three different courses. So there's like travel between them. Uh, I played with him on Friday morning at Miramar. We teed off at 6 a.m. or 6.15 or something. And we finished up in about 2 hours 30. And then he traveled through to Karori. And I think he played a Hurria Valley after that, which is two rounds there because it's nine holes. I tried to convince him to um, sneak a nine hole in at Booties and Brews, which uh, should be opening (laughs) later this week. But... um, yeah, he had a lot on his plate, so. So let me get off. this. Let me get this right. He he, because the the breakdown I've got here is probably not as detailed as that. But he played three hundred holes over the week. He played fifty four holes a day, and he played at three different courses a day. Yeah. Wow, that is mm. that's ridiculous. Yeah, I think the Saturday after I played, what they he did it in Kapiti and played yeah. Parparamu and. Why can I, I think, and Kapiti twice. Was he keeping score for every round and every Yeah, shot? yeah, he scored every round, kept all his stats, kept all his birdies and eagles and blah, blah, blah. I think, he, ah. I, I think his highest round, he said, was 80 and shot under 80 the rest of them. So he did well. Yeah. I wonder how much his handicap changed throughout the week because that's, what, 21 rounds of goal. <laughs> Daily. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone that he uh, submitted in. Okay, well, I'm past my admin stuff there. Uh, do you want to start off with some longer questions there, Sam, or do you want to? Uh... Yeah, I just wanted to maybe dig into Dan and just um, get some information <laughs> about his uh, his travel schedule that he's just come back from. Um, I think it started in just before June, was it May? Yeah, Early uh, May? End of, end of April, I got over there. So. Mate, there you go. Yeah, end of April in well. South Africa, is that right? Yeah, yeah, two in South Africa there. Um, and then, wow. yeah. Sweden and so, Ireland uh, and Spain? Yep, they're all in Portugal, um, France, Italy. Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty nuts. 20, and then, I think um, it was 
22 events in 26 weeks. Far out. Is it true, yeah. Dan, is it true yeah. that you took only one single Level Peaks tee with you and it lasted you the whole trip? Oh, I had three, three tees, actually. You took three tees with you for the whole time. 100 rounds of golf, yeah. Yeah, uh, so that's so pretty good, man. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I just um did some digging on the challenge tour website. It's actually pretty good, and um it says you had eight events before the Open, and then you played in the Open Championship at Royal St George, and then you started to um catch a little bit of fire after that, and you had some pretty good finishes. We got T10 at the Irish Challenge, and uh, T9 in Spain, T3 in Northern Ireland, T11 in Germany, T6 in Portugal, and then your first challenge tour win at uh, Challenge Costa Brava in Spain. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that and, jeez, first one, how yeah. good? Yeah, oh, mate, it's, um, yeah, I'm still sort of processing it now, really. It's, uh, it was pretty amazing. It's obviously a very long season and we had uh, had two tournaments at the same venue uh, and that was the second one there and missed the cut by one in the first week. And so, obviously, um, wasn't uh, wasn't all going too great, and I think in that first round I was two over through 17 holes um, in that second event as well. Um, luckily for me, we actually had to call it quits due to daylight, and so I came back and played the 18th the next morning um, with a favourable um, tailwind on a par five, and managed to, managed to eagle that um, to start my day off, and then uh, yeah, that's sort of, I think that got me back on the cut line at that point after the first round. And then, yeah, had some pretty tough conditions to battle through in round two. Um, posted a pretty solid four under round there. And, um, yeah, I sort of looked back on that round and figured, you know, that was the toughest, probably the toughest conditions I've played all year. But, you know, I showed a pretty, pretty solid number and so really thought about, you know, the things I did well and, you know, how patient I was out there. I was a lot more patient, you know, obviously in tough conditions, any mistake that you make just gets compounded. So, yeah, I just made sure that I had it in all the right spots and, take on anything more than I needed to and uh, yeah put that into the final two rounds and uh, yeah obviously that third round was was just an absolute dream having having my last round ever and um, in a pretty pretty crucial moment and then managed to yeah follow it up in round four so I mean it was just just a crazy week I think I was 21 under in my last 55 holes which I've never done before in my life so yeah um, come together, you know, at the right time, and uh, yeah, right at the end of the season, uh, sort of, you know, halfway through that uh, that first round, I was sort of feeling like I was running out of juice. So it shows um, how fickle the game can be. All right, yeah, that's wow. some uh, some crazy good golf, man. Fifty five hundred, jeez. So um, what what do you think uh, managed to get you over the line? Like, what what sort of part of your game? What what happened? In that, in that final round, did you round putt better? Did you um, drive it better? Yeah, like... I, was, I, was, yeah, I was putting pretty well from sort of inside 20 feet, really, um, which is sort of my Achilles heel. I don't tend to hold a lot from that range. And yeah, I was just rolling it really nicely, gave myself a lot of chances. Um, and I actually, to be fair, my, my short game improved quite a lot in that second half of the season. Um, it was, you know, it wasn't a great place uh, early on. And so, I just saw a short game specialist um, in London sort of halfway through the year and did some work with him. And from then on, um, you know, my short game inside 50 yards uh, dramatically improved um, just through better processes, obviously slightly better technique as well. Um, and then that, that again was a big help. I, I made some pretty clutch up and downs in that final round to sort of keep the momentum going and, um, yeah, managed to, managed to hold some nice putts as well. So, yeah, I think the short game was, uh, was really a thing that got me through in the end. What did you What did you learn from him, Dan? What were the, What were some of the changes that you made? Um, well, oh, to be fair, my technique was pretty horrible. <laughs> I was pretty steep <laughs> on the way back, and then got steeper on the way down. So it's sort of like this over the top shut face movement. It was just you look at it on camera and sort of want to throw up a little bit. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we sorted we sorted that out. Got got the basics, um, you know, somewhat where they wanted to be, and and then it was more about you know looking at different lies and how it's all going to come out and you know, picking your landing spots and how it's going to break and, you know, where you want to leave it if you if you don't, you know, you, basically his thing is what shot do you need to play to be able to hold it? And if you don't, you know, what shot's going to give you the best opportunity of having a realistic, you know, up and down 
chat. So if you if you don't quite catch it, you still want to you know, obviously be pretty uh, short distance away from the hole. And so obviously yeah. from there, started to think about more about what shots I wanted to play. Um, you know, the not always the high percentage ones, but the ones where you know I felt like I was going to give myself the best chance of getting it up and down. Um, and so yeah, I was sort of working on that. Did a lot of a um, lot of stuff off the course. You know, I play around and then head to the shipping green for half an hour to an hour after my round and really real dot really dial in all that stuff and so um yeah just just the whole process in general around short game is just sort of getting yeah. me a little bit more in detail and so I've sort of gone from thinking you know I miss the ground like oh shit this is going to be a, you know it's going to be tough ass from anywhere to thinking how am I going to hold this or you know it's, it's just a completely different mind shift I guess was was the big thing yeah what's what, what's that like for you? Because your ball striking is like superior. I think, yeah. and that like, I think that stands up around the world. I don't care who it is. Your ball striking, I think, is probably as good as anybody's. That must give you a lot of confidence knowing now that you've got a short game to back it up. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it was a thing, you know. It, and now it's not a case of, you know, I don't have to put so much pressure on my long game because I know if I miss a green, then it's, you know, I can yeah. actually back myself to up and down, you know. Um, so it even takes a bit more pressure off the long game. And, yeah, so a lot less stressful when I'm going around the golf course, um, and you know, over the course of the season, you know, any stress that you can take away, it's um, it's going to help you out in the long run. So yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a good decision I think for me to go and see that that short game specialist. Sure. Who who was it? If if you don't mind me uh, asking, guy, guy named Alex Buckner. He's um, oh, yeah. younger guy, but yeah, he, he works with a lot of the um, a lot of the challenge tour guys and guys that are sort of starting out in the European tour and. Yeah, he was he was recommended to me by David Boot, who I've met through my management company, and he's also on the Challenge Tour. So, yeah, um, just a yeah, I don't know, seemed like a good opportunity to sort of pick someone's brains while while I was over there. And uh, yeah, it turns out that his stuff really really resonates with me. So yeah, it's um, a good mix, really. That um, oh, sorry, oh that uh, that that. It's really interesting here you say like oh you're, you're working on some technique and stuff like that because for for me um who's really good at answering emails in a, in, in a golf club and then i see you hitting golf balls i mean you've been at golf harbor a couple of times and i've seen you uh on on video and stuff and you say yeah i'm a little bit steep mate it's fine if i saw that i'd be hitting the couch and being like don't worry i'll save that for this so i mean you have to be so good to get out there and start playing on tour who's like someone out there that you look at at the moment and you go I wish I could hit it like him. Is there anyone out there like that, or? Oh, it's like different parts of the game that everyone has. That you know, you look at mm. like Rory's driving, for example. You think, God, oh, kill to be able to hit it like that, or you know, Tiger's iron play when he's driving. You know, being able to work it whatever way he likes and have so much control over the ball. So yeah, I think everyone that you look at has their own thing about their game that you know gets them to that level. Um, and yeah, I mean, for me. I think there's still a, still a bit of work to do with my long game. You know, it is my strength, but at the same time, you know, I still I still hit shots that, you know, to the simple simple mistakes that uh, a lot of guys out there don't really make. And and I think that's the big thing is that you know a lot of guys out there do hit bad shots, but they you know they think about their shots in a way that when they do hit them, it's, they're not getting penalised as badly for it. And so that's that's another thing that I learned when I was over there is just being able to manage those those bad shots and um you know obviously if things you know if i'm not hitting it as good as i usually do then being able to, to manage that and know that right i'm not having my best day it's just you know let's get it around let's give myself some opportunities when they come but don't try and force the issues you know so yeah, yeah it's nice. been great to, to just see how guys go about their business over there and uh yeah sort of integrate their processes into into my own game well this um this just actually came through from andrew jackson over at motorway there um, say best ball striker he's seen in a long time. So uh, you've got the support uh, of Andrew there for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that was that was a that was a good week there when I was with Stevie. Still couldn't beat Foxy though. Know. You and Foxy just went shot for shot that week, eh? Yeah, yeah, no, that was that was crazy good. I enjoyed that full four rounds together, and uh, yeah, no, he was just too good on that final day. So. I don't, he was never going to let me beat him. I realise that now. <laughs> he was just, he, yeah, he didn't, he didn't want the young buck to beat him. But no, it, um, it was pretty cool to watch. Yeah. Um, do you know? Do you keep hold of your stats, Dan? Do you know? Do you know your stats? 
I'm just uh, looking at some. Uh, don't know. I'm, don't open them up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking at some uh, stats here on the European Tour website. Obviously, they're a bit old school and a bit vague. But um, do you know what your driving accuracy percentage would be? Oh, around 50, 60 percent. Not too bad. 50, 58. So tour average is 59. So it's pretty good. Um, driving distance. Oh, gosh. Oh, yes. And yards or meters? Uh, yards, it is. Uh, maybe 290. Ish? Well, uh, it's got you here at 300.0, so 300 on the number. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, two average is 300, yours is 303.25, so uh, just above average, oh. which is pretty Play good. Ranking short. 27th, that's pretty good. Yeah. That. And uh, greens and regulation percentage? Oh, the 76, I think. Uh, 66.6, <laughs> 66. oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, which well. is 19th. So that's actually uh, that's actually your, your strength and according to these stats. So, um, yeah, right. And uh, what about stroke average for the season? Stroke average, uh, I'm going to say 71, just Ooh. under 71. 69.9 so that's pretty yeah. good tour average was 71 yeah. so this is challenge to 21st yeah, yeah challenge tour. yeah right what about you do you know how they yeah. collate these yeah, stats yeah, on then what was that sorry man? like how, they, in terms of how they collate the stats on tour they kind of only pick like one or two holes around don't they that they take like driving yeah. numbers for because like you hit it way further than 270 meters um <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I mean, it all depends on the conditions and whatnot, but, um, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, they don't take it off every hole, I know that much. Um, not really are you good, I'm sure that, that are you good friends with uh, Geordie? Geordie? Geordie Lowe. Oh, yeah, 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 good okay, so, there, there you go. There's, There's a little comment there for you, I thought that was oh, pretty he's, funny. Yeah. <laughs> he's three, he's three uh, okay. yards past he, he probably He's probably got me, to be fair. Is a loud one there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, pretty pretty bang on for the stat guess there. Um, I want to we'll move it across uh, to some questions that we've got in. I've got about five or six questions here uh, from people coming in. Um, start with let's start. Well, actually, start with one of our members who's actually away at the moment. Where's oh god, I've lost the comments. Uh, there we go. Uh, right, so we've got a uh, Peter Van Campton. Yeah, he's a really big fan. Uh, what's your favourite club in the bag, and who's the one person in the world you don't want to lose a match against to? Oh, favourite club, probably the driver, to be fair. Um, yeah, always been a strength in the game, and just love yeah, hitting the odd bomb here and there. Let the shoulders, <laughs> let the shoulders go a little bit. Um, person I don't want to lose a match to. Uh, Jaden Ford. <laughs> he's, uh, obviously he's a pretty he's a pretty decent young player and and we'll we'll have our little matches back home and um and yeah you know he always talks a big game but didn't you have one on him. saturday yeah yeah put him in his place so. yeah good <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was the score but, like? no, he's, he's good it's good to you know he's, he's obviously a pretty competitive young guy and um he's he's got a bright future ahead of him so yeah it's nice to nice to be able to go out and have a hit with him and so, yeah, that's, I don't want to lose him, though. They haven't yet. So. <laughs> Never allow it. Uh, yeah. what, okay, I'll move on to the next one we got here. What about what about just a... Yeah, we'll go here. Uh, what's been your favourite uh, tournament to play so far? And uh, what's your biggest work on uh, as a player? Let's just say right now. What are you, what are you currently working on right now? And uh, yeah, your favourite tournament to play so far? Yeah, um, I'd definitely the Open. Championship would be my favourite tournament. Um, yeah, I mean, just the whole week in general, you know, with, with the crowds and because, you know, the European crowds are, you know, they're all just boisterous and, you know, they all, I think there was Freedom Day um, over, out in the UK there during that week. And so there was uh, there was a lot of people out sort of celebrating, you know, being free of lockdown and so uh, some pretty, some pretty um, yeah, boisterous drunk people out there. So, yeah, it's great atmosphere. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously, just the whole history behind the event is just pretty, 
pretty amazing. And so, yeah, um, definitely, definitely been my favourite. And then uh, biggest work on, I think probably still, still my short game in general. Um, it has improved, but you know there are you know moments under pressure where you know you do you do get a bit tight and the uh, the trust and the confidence probably isn't quite where it needs to be. So yeah, I guess just keep putting myself in those positions and you know trusting that what I've worked on over the last six seven months is um, is the right stuff. And then yeah, obviously you're not going to pull it off every time, but um, you know the more you put yourself in that position, the more you you commit to your processes and all that, then obviously the better you'll get. So yeah, that's. Uh, that's where I'm looking to make the biggest games, I guess. On that, um, on that note, Dan, with the um, with your favourite tournament, because you've you've only you played the US Open and the British Open, right? Those are the two majors mm-hmm. that you played. How do they yeah. compare? Like, what? How would you describe? I guess the difference between US Open at Pebble Beach for one is probably one of the cooler places that you could probably play. How would you compare the two two weeks? Um, honestly, it's pretty. Once I think once you're inside the ropes, it's pretty similar. You know, obviously the crowds are. You know, pretty intense. Um, the golf courses are both set up pretty difficult. Obviously, the style of golf is a lot different. Um, yeah. That'd probably be the biggest thing for me. Um, but yeah, everything outside of that, in regards to the atmosphere and the way things are run, pretty pretty similar um, in that respect. They obviously look after the players really well. They they go the extra mile to make sure that we're looked after. And um, yeah, so anything anything that you need out there is, is catered for. So um, yeah, just the style of golf really. It's, um, is what it is for me. Nice. Okay. Well, okay. Well, they just keep on coming in. We've just got question after question. But um, I, this one here is this is a great one. Uh, apart from um, beating Burger on on tour there uh, on the Tuesday, uh, what's been your your funniest maybe interaction? Could be a fan moment, golf golf moment uh, on tour there so far. Got anything that stands out? Um, there's one. There's one that stands out. I won't. I won't name drop him because I'm not sure if he wants me to uh, to throw him under the bus like that. But so we're in. <laughs> I can't remember what country it was, but it was about 11:30 at night. Like um, you, so this is. <laughs> you can probably get. You can probably get. <laughs> uh, don't. <laughs> um, and so we're 11:30 at night. We're getting getting to the airport, and so one of the guys who rings rings me up, and I'm you know getting my rental car sorted. Rings me up. He says, uh, "Dan, um, just got my car. Um, it's a manual, and I've I've never driven a manual in my life before." And I'm like, oh, "Yeah, great. So, so what do you want me to do about it?" And he's like, "Can you can you teach me how to drive?" <laughs> <Over the phone. laughs> I'm pretty pretty bad at explaining things as it is, and so I'm trying to teach this guy how to, you know, balancing the clutch, and you know, if you if you're in doubt, just chuck the clutch, and then you won't spill all the jazz. Just a Try and give him some confidence, um, and so we we chat on the phone for about half an hour, and he gets, you know, sort of bunny hops his way out of the airport, um, and there's a massive roundabout there, and it's eleven thirty at night, but over there, people, you know, people in Europe, they do think a lot later. There's still plenty of cars driving around, and he stops at this roundabout, he sort of bunny hops into it, and he stalls in the middle of the roundabout, <laughs> and he's and he's obviously livid. He just panics doesn't know what to do, can't restart the car, can't get himself going again. Chucks the hazard lights on, just steps out, middle of the roundabout, just puts his hands on his head and just stands there within his car park. And he's got no, got no idea what to do. And so he gets his composure a little while later, gets back in the car and sort of bunny hops out. Once all these cars have gone past and it's clear to go. And um, at this point, I was off the phone. I'd, had hung up the phone because my phone was going to die and I need to get to my place. I'm like, sorry, mate. Like, you're on your own. <laughs> you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I've got to get to my place as well. So, I, yeah, I sort of leave him to it. And I'm driving along and he must have looked for me because we get to the toll road and I see this car that's just stopped there, has its lights on, and I pull up to the toll road and I look and sure enough, it's him. And he can't get his car started again. He's like paying for his toll and all that, bar lifts up. And again, he just doesn't move. And so I'm just like there watching him as I'm getting my ticket and everything. Funny hops out with his hazard lights on and he sort of <laughs> takes about 20 seconds to sort that out and he's just off on his way. And <laughs> oh no, it was oh. just an you absolute nightmare. So, wait, oh, wait. All right, I'll tell we, you. We, we, <laughs> have to track, we have to track down who this is. <laughs> we have to track down who this is because we've got to get them on the. Um, 
on the podcast and asked him if they learned how to drive manual since, surely. <laughs> yeah, no, he's learned he's learned, so he's got a lot better since then. Oh, he's got, no, he's got, got a that, better. That first, oh, mate. After uh, your experience like that, he'll learn fast. Manual over in Europe, like, he's on the other side of the road for starters. The road rules are different. No one speaks English, so he's not getting help from anyone. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, uh, yeah, that's some of the stuff. I reckon there'd be so cool. many stories like that on tour from golfers never having driven manual because you get it heaps up in Europe, hey, heaps of cars and manual. Um, yeah, yeah, well, the automatics are way more expensive as well. And so it's like, yeah, obviously, being like a lot of the guys on the challenge where they're trying to cut down costs, and obviously, you know, it's just like, oh, I'll just get a manual and try and uh, work it out as I go. Obviously, not realizing how difficult it is to figure it out for your first time. So, <laughs> Yeah. I've got a I've got a story with Tony of a manual car in Christchurch, and that's the flattest place in the country. So we'll have to get we'll have to get we'll have to get Tony on. Um, I'm involved in the story as well. It was pretty funny, but we we'll have to get Tony on as a guest to share that story. Oh, oh definitely. <laughs> I couldn't imagine anything worse than uh, getting given a car and, and not knowing how to drive it in a different country, nonetheless. Um, whatever time of the, the evening it might have been or, or, or god hour that you got in in the morning uh flying into those places um and actually talking about the the traveling around i actually had uh two of these uh, i guess it's one that you get asked a million times so we don't want to spend um too much time on them but um sort of like given uh the pandemic it's a very much a part of our lives how do you go about setting your schedule for 2022 and just on top of that We've had it again from, uh, that was from Ben Ashford and from, where is he? Scotty Hansen, right here. Uh, same thing, like, actually, how hard is it to plan with the, with that changing landscape of the COVID uh, thing going on overseas? Is it is it so much harder that you're thinking, I don't really want to go, or are you really picking your tournaments very specifically on what you choose to do? Um, well, to be fair, we were, we were pretty lucky when we got over there. Um, this past year, you know, they were obviously they, they had a lot of COVID cases, but life was relatively a bit to normal for them. Um, they had no plans to cancel events. Um, and, you know, I think they ran it in a way that, you know, we were all pretty well sheltered from, from all of that. We were, you know, we were tested twice a week um, for COVID and, you know, we were staying in tournament hotels that were specifically for the players. And so we were mixing with the public and all that sort of stuff. And so there was no real risk of, um, there being an outbreak within the tour, so they ran it really well in that regard. It was obviously pretty, pretty tough to you know just go from the hotel to the golf course to the hotel back and forth, you know, without being able to get out and you know sort of live a normal life. But um, yeah, they ran it. They ran it really well and did what they had to do to make sure that we had a you know solid schedule in place. And I think um, the only thing for next year is that obviously with this new var- variant. Um, that's you know made a bit of disruption to these South African events, and um, it's obviously pretty rife through through Europe at the moment. So it'll be be interesting to see uh, what happens to the schedule if, if anything changes over the next couple of months. But um, yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, they they'll just have to go through a similar plan, I guess, and, and make sure that we are we are well um, covered for any any of that any of those situations, I guess. Do you plan on uh, playing yeah. Balance Tour to start the year, or do you plan on starting out in Europe? What's your What's your plan? Um, I'm hoping to get a couple of invites in Europe on the main tour. Um, start me off, and so I'll I'll probably head over uh, mid to late January, uh, depending on what I can get into. I, I won't find out for probably another month as to what my first event will be. And yep. they haven't put the Challenge Tour schedule out yet as well, so I'm not really sure when that's going to kick off. Um, but yeah, so timeline mid to late January, not really sure what tournament will be my first one to just play it by year. Some, something that I did pretty much all the last year as well, you know, playing off in box and you know, I wasn't finding out if I was in, in tournaments from, you know, the Sunday night prior. So yeah. No nothing new, which is nice. How do you how do you prepare for that? Knowing like not knowing I guess if you've got to start maybe one or two weeks out. Like how do you go about preparing for that, making sure that you're tournament ready? Yeah, I guess you just have to to go into expecting to play and if you don't then you know you get an unexpected week off um it's pretty obviously pretty mentally taxing um doing that and you know there was a lot of last minute travel plans being made i was lucky that i that i had a good management company behind me to help me out with that sort of stuff um because yeah. i mean being able to you know being over there on my own and you know having to 
especially with all these restrictions and you know documents you have to fill out with COVID and all that sort of stuff, it would just be an absolute nightmare. And you know, I don't think I would have been able to get through the year without their help. And um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's just a just a pretty interesting time that we're in, and you just have to be ready to play. Um, yeah. Nice, so, are you ready to play? Probably not at the moment. I've had a decent <laughs> break, so uh, there's probably there's probably a little rust there. But uh, no, I will be when the time comes. Yeah, definitely. Nice. So, I guess just on that note about the challenge tour and European tour, so you've you've got full status on the challenge, right? So you've got the ability to pick and choose your challenge tour schedule. When does um? Yeah. So that starts a little bit later in the year as opposed to the European tour. So I guess you're just going to try and play as much as you can in Europe. And then get to the challenge tour. And will that be your main focus? Like, when you've got a full schedule on the challenge to try to get your card through that route, what happens if you get an invite into the main tour? Do you, do you take the chance, or what's the what's the thought process behind that? Yeah. Um, so I think for me, you know, I won't I won't play a main tour event one unless there's a week off on the challenge tour or two. Sometimes the tournaments double up, so any points that you make on the main tour, um, your equivalent say I come tied twentieth on. The European what CP World Tour, sorry, um, and tied twentieth there, then I'd get the equivalent of tied twentieth on the challenge tour on onto my challenge tour ranking. Um, right. So sometimes they have a they have a bunch of events that run like that, and so that's sometimes a good opportunity to, to you know take a stab at a at a main tour event and see if you can get some decent points there. But yeah, um, yeah, the main focus is going to be challenge tour, um, unless obviously I get into an event on the main tour early on, have a good finish, maybe. You've, or win or you know keep having top fives or whatever that plays me into the next event um yeah. and keep riding that road but yeah um obviously yeah still still pretty much um chopping and changing um a lot of last minute travel plans will probably be made but yeah just the way things are at the moment until i can get myself settled on on the main tour yeah nice, do, you, do you enjoy that like the last minute the the sort of the jumping on the opportunity or, or do you prefer um, like to know what's going on? And I've always, I've always been, been one to sort of plan ahead and you know be pretty organised with what I'm doing. So it was a bit of a shock to the system um, early on. But I guess you know with that comes the mindset that you know any tournament that you, that you can get into it's just a bonus, um, mm. and you sort of go and you know you've got nothing to lose. You you weren't in the event to begin with, and so you know what do you have to lose from it if you don't play well? And so. I guess that sort of made it a little bit easier for me to go out there and just play my game and not have to worry about what happened if you know things didn't go to plan. So um, yeah, I guess in a way it, it might have helped throughout the season. Um, but yeah, it's definitely it's definitely different. That's for sure. So um, so thinking about like what what's going to be going on forward here, and I me mean, just um, looking through these comments, I actually had another one from Andrew Jackson. Uh, which is one I did actually want to ask is um, there'll be two parts to this question. I guess looking forward to the uh, the year going at the moment, does the does the New Zealand Open come up on your radar um, with everything sort of going on, or is it that's just a complete wash? Or uh, definitely definitely not a complete wash. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all very much up in the air at the moment. Um, it would be great to come back and play it if if my schedule allows it. So I think there's yeah. a couple of tournaments in Asia. Um, on the main tour, so if it ties in with those, then obviously you know it's one flight um, yeah. from there to get back home to play it. But yeah, obviously not not 100% sure on, on the schedule. But yeah, if yeah. Uh, if it was plausible, then yeah, I'd, I'd love to play it. So obviously, you know, it's always a um, great opportunity playing your home open and yeah. So get through. Well, then that can, leads, leads into the next one is what what would be your favourite NZ tournament and why was it Middlewai? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Loves I mean, yeah. It's probably, yeah. I mean, Miroir was great. Um, obviously, you know, being able to play four rounds with uh, with Foxy there, and um, you know, obviously, obviously, look up to him. He's you know been through a similar route that I'm going through at the moment, and yeah, to have him come back and and um, you know show us all how it's done on the main tour was pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's probably probably weeks that I'll I'll never forget uh, the last tournament score ever, and you know. Going up against New Zealand's best golfer is um, yeah pretty fun. So 
Yeah, you're right. Probably would be mirror line for sure. <laughs> well, that, that's the other part is that we, we, we've done a few times on our Kiwi Golf Club page, we do like best courses under under $50. And, and I mean, that doesn't really matter. But what would be your favourite New Zealand golf course to go and play? Ooh. So what? Under $50? Yeah, let's say if there's one, your favourite one and then maybe your favourite hidden gem. Favourite hidden gem under that. Um, or... Kenlock's right up there for me. Um, okay, yes, good. I like him. Yeah, he's going yeah, well. That's the best. <laughs> that's a, yeah, yeah Kenlock is right up there. Um, it'd be interesting, interesting with the new tournament, uh, the new tournament, the new courses going up in um, in Mangfai, the TRI, and um, so I'm, you know, I've heard they are going to be, you know, another step better than uh, Taridi. So mm-hmm. I'm sure, you know, that'd, that'd be um, pretty unreal if that's the case, which would be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, hidden hidden gem. I honestly haven't played too many hidden gems. You know, they're all um, you sort of you know tournament courses that I've sort of been around and played. Um, what, would be yeah. the best in, what would be the best in Wellington that you might have played growing up, or or penance or junior penance, anything like that? What would be the best in Wellington that we might not know about? Might not know about. They've done they've done some work on poet. Um, I think, yeah, it's now called yeah, it's good. Morgan's Retreat. Morgan's Retreat, yeah. Yeah, Gareth so, um, Morgan owns it, yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, so I haven't been around there a long time, but they did some stuff to it. I like so the second hole there, which it's all nine hole courses. Yeah. The second hole there is like a proper, proper hole. Yeah, um, that is a proper hole. Island most, Green, most cool crazy. Yeah. Actually, Dan, on that note of hidden gems, I heard you had a game with, with, with your friend Liam Jones up at Walkworth. Not so long ago, he said you he said he said you striped it around there. I think you might have like thirty four putts for sixty two or something. I can't yeah, I can't remember what I had that day actually. Um all cool, right. But, yeah, it was, um, that was that was a fun day. That was good. First time I played with him. I think I yeah. Got off to a pretty hot start and he had never seen me play before and he was he was pretty shocked and, and then I don't know, I might have thrown in a couple of bogeys here and there and uh, it all, all came back down to earth, but no, that, that was cool. I didn't enjoy walk with actually. It's funky, funky track. Fun little uh, track, out. yeah. No, it was, it was cool. <laughs> Enjoyed that. All right, well, we want to finish it off um, a little, a little bit light. Um, I'll, I'll just jump into one more because uh, I think I think this man he, he loves a bit of TV time, so we got to give him this one here. Um, Andrew White, cheer to Dan. He's a beautiful man. Have you ever had the yips? <laughs> I have certainly had the yips. Yep. Um, I specifically remember Murawai. Um, Murawai opened a few years ago. I was playing with Luke Brown um, and someone else. Can't quite remember off the top of my head. And we got to got to the ninth hole. Got a dead straight two footer. Nothing on it. Completely missed the hole. Um, full electric shock in the hand. You know quite a few people watching which was probably the thing for me um and yeah i just completely missed the hole from two feet lined up and everything it was pretty pretty piss poor and um got to the 18th had apart from one foot uh almost with it short same thing just no idea what was going on um but yeah i've said, i've had the yep um not a great feeling you know the old electric shock not being able to commit to any part um so yeah, that's sort of, terrifying man it would have been yeah maybe four years ago i think um and then i went you know i saw saw jay carter and you know my my coach kevin smith back home and we basically rebuilt the putting stroke from scratch went through all the basics um you know tempo alignment um think i even got a new putter um, so yeah really did the full rebuild and took took a while to, to come back but yeah that's getting there Still in the crowd at the moment, so still, still not uh, not as comfortable as I'd like. But yeah, I can still I can get over a putt and you know commit to the line. And but yeah, the the jet is um, you know. Oh, it's it's <laughs> good. I mean, it's, not, it's I mean good to hear that you that you rebuilt it and stuff. But those uh those fundamentals and starting back there from scratch and what you're saying about rebuilding your putting stroke, I think 
I think more of us need to understand, like sometimes you can just lose it and you need to actually go back and, and start again at the basics, which um, mm-hmm. is a real big step to do. And, and just to say that that's what you got to go go ahead and do, it's pretty easy to be like, nah, I'll be fixed next week. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, um, so and, no, it's not, and it's not cool. searching for anything either. It's making sure that what you're doing is, you know, you, you actually believe that that's what you need to do. You, you know, you can watch as many YouTube videos as you want, but you know, you, you get so many <laughs> different ideas that pop into your head that it just, oh. you know, makes things worse. So yeah, making sure that what you are, you know, if you do decide to do the full rebuild, then you know, you actually believe that that's what you need to do, and you stick to it. You don't keep chopping and changing things because yeah, it's that lack of consistency. I think is the big thing. It starts to catch people out. Yeah. Do you still own the putter? Uh, yeah, I think I do. Is it? Yeah. It's oh, right oh I sleep with it. Hasn't been on the uh, helicopter yeah. trip. That's good. No, no, we still got it. <laughs> <laughs> um i've got i've got this one here before i like to finish up on a, a little grind my gears segment because that's what we like to do but uh liam jones is actually tuning in uh pretty sure it's still on the trees on the 14th hole sorry mate he's still claiming it there so huh? yeah yeah that was our, from our day at walk with um <laughs> i did just gonna put one on 14 and hit the tree and he, he managed to pipe one past me and so uh yeah that was the one time that i drove me all day and i yeah i hear about it a lot yeah so uh, yeah. Yeah, no, fair play on that. I think it's still beating him in the hole, though. There we go. Still got him on the hole. It's uh, it's what you write down on the scorecard. That matters. Not a yeah, okay. out into the trees. Um, okay, so we, we, we're getting close. We've only got a, a very uh, few a few minutes left. Uh, so I'd like, I'd like to finish up on a, a little grindy gears sort of segment. We've done it uh, a few times. Um, for me, I'm going to go with golfers that I've seen wearing a right glove but they're a right-handed player but playing <laughs> right-handed mm. and 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 i've seen two separate groups in the same week at golf harbor and if they tune in i'm so sorry but you need to know that's not what you do <laughs> it's not how it is it's not you don't because you're a right-handed player the glove does not go on the right hand and when i mentioned it as a very polite sort of are you sure you don't need the other one <laughs> that was the hint. So that's what grinds my gears uh, in the golfing world right now is people not picking that one up. I mean, there's a million videos on YouTube on how to put on a glove, and if there's not, I'm going to have to start making one. Um, but Cam, anything in the in the golfing world there that grinds your gears this week, there, buddy? Yeah, there actually has been, um, to be honest, and it was a, and it was a personal one too. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, Fraser, but the last couple of weeks, probably the last three, four weeks, I've started dressing a little more casually um, to, to the coaching sessions and somebody actually made a comment to me that I should probably tuck my shirt in and wear a belt and I thought <laughs> like that's the whole purpose of why I decided to stop tucking my shirt in and wear a belt because a lot of the people that are coming for lessons with me are pretty pretty casual just getting into the game and I kind of realized like I might as, I'm still wearing a golf polo still wearing nice chino pants and, and golf shoes and a golf hat and stuff but um, yeah being told that I should that I should uh, tuck my shirt in up. And, and, and put a belt on because um, it doesn't look professional. I just I just scoffed at him a little bit, but won't name, won't name who it was. But um, um, yeah, that, I'm really that sorry about that. Today. I'm really sorry Is about you, that Fraser? comment. Yeah, no, we got a <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't we got a dress code at Golf Harbour, mate. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's that's actually kind of funny though. Eh? coming over to coaching session and uh, and getting hit up about needing to tuck the shirt in. That's uh that's a bit rough. Yeah. Well, I just I just thought like obviously I don't do that every day, but I just kind of figured like I've got you know some some young guys coming to teach like to make them and they're new to golf, probably the first golf lesson sort of thing. Like it's trying to make them feel comfortable. I'm going to try and you know. Dresses mm-hmm. dress similar to what they're going to wear. I think the whole clothing barriers and golf is sort of changing anyway. So I thought I might as well, mm-hmm. might as well try and do that. But yeah, that's that's yeah, more. That's not just you, thing. man. It gets pretty casual. I I, I witnessed a um, golf pro a couple of weeks ago doing a women's clinic, and he was in cargo shorts, uh, a polo shirt, untucked Crocs, and a tightless hat. Right. Up. <laughs> yeah, he looked like he's having a great time. So. <laughs> right there. What about you, Mr. Level Pigs, mate? What's grinding your gears? Uh I think it's I think it's just a, a sort of the supply chain issue. Like I work in oh, yeah. I guess the retail space and do a lot of club fitting and also do a lot of club building at home and etc. etc. And uh 
it's very easy to get caught out with one component missing and your sort of your little project or your task sits there for three weeks while you're waiting for one component and then it arrives and you finish it and it's done but uh yeah it's it's getting out of control and i think it's going to get worse going forward so yeah i agree i don't think it's going to get better so yeah this is also maybe uh anybody who's purchasing golf clubs or has ordered golf clubs like man the the delays are real and it's not our fault man. <laughs> there's nothing we can do we're doing our best so Please don't blame us. We're trying. <laughs> We're just trying to help. So, yeah. And if you're purchasing level pegs, make sure to stock up with a few thousand boxes now because, I mean, there'll be some supply issues. Just buy all oh, no, the stuff. There'll be no supply issues, mate. They'll arrive <laughs> the next day. Don't yeah, you worry about there that. It is. <laughs> <laughs> the country. Hey, what about, what about uh, our, our guest, Dan? Is there anything out there in the golfing world that just, just gets to you that you're, you're not about? Um, that stands out? It's grinding your gears, Dan. Oh, I mean... There's, there's actually a moment where it was in the final actually, um, so it's a little personal one, and um, where we've got we've got these walking scorers, and um, so I'm not playing great. There's other been, I'm not the best week that I had in the final there, and I doubled the 18th three days in a row, round two, three, and four. Um, so doubled it in round I can't remember if it was round three or round four. Uh, what one it was, but the walking story comes off. You know, I say, "Take your heart, mate." And moving on, and it's like, "Yeah, it's just, it's just a shame about that stupid mistake that you made on 18, wasn't it?" And obviously, I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty livid. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty pissed off about oh. how I played that whole last couple of days, and then he's thrown in that little comment. Obviously, you know, he's he means well. He's not trying to piss me off or anything. So, yeah. you know, sometimes they, just, yeah, they say things. They're trying to oh, help no. it. it really doesn't. And, oh, yeah. that, that, I mean, I, I can, like, I can yeah, feel that. You're right. I'm going to keep walking now. <laughs> so I don't say something that I, I shouldn't. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. So that's, that's probably the big thing when, when you know, the guys that um, don't quite know how you're feeling, they come up and say something just to just to tip you over that edge a little bit more. <laughs> just throw a curveball yeah. in there, right? Eh? Something like that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Mate, I, I know how many I wrote down on the scorecard. You put it up yeah. on the board. I don't even <laughs> know yeah. again. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, so, yeah, that'd that's be, that'd be nice. that. That beats my glove one by miles, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, so we'll wrap it up there. We're just a couple minutes uh, over our, over our hour, which is great. Now it's been absolute uh, pleasure, Dan, to have you on the podcast. Uh, chat about uh, your experiences. Get some yeah, new uh, manual that. manual stories uh, that we got there too. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna to have to track down that person um i'm pretty fast so no all, all the best uh with everything going forward and we, we hope to get you back on again again soon so um yes, yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks for coming out Dan. Fun, Pleasure. yeah thanks Thank for coming on, yeah okay now the leave background <laughs> and end do it phrase <laughs> thanks everybody have a good night